me pray before we begin. Lord, I just ask that your spirit would be indeed present. You are welcome in this place. This is your place. So Lord, as we walk through this scripture today, speak to us, challenge us deeply, confront us where we need to be confronted, and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this week has been a tough week. Um, I saw this on Facebook, I thought it was worth posting. Only a woman who delivered a baby without an epidural can truly understand a guy who has a cold. <laughs> I, I told that to Annie this week as I was wrestling with, it wasn't really a big cold, but I told that to Annie this week and, and she just said, now I understand. <laughs> So, if I sound nasally this morning, it's, it's because I've been suffering like, a, like someone in labor uh, through the week. <clears throat> we, we left off last week with a conversation that was taking place in the Gospel of John in chapter 3. Jesus has a conversation with a person. His name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee a teacher of the law, a member of the Jewish ruling council, the, the Sanhedrin, as high up as you can get. And, and, and Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the night. And, and we talked about all of what, what that means. And, and then in the conversation, Jesus says to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and Nicodemus Ask the question, can a man enter a mother's womb a second time? It, it, can a man do that? I don't understand. And, and, and Jesus went on to explain. And, and then he brings up this story that took place, and we find it in the book of Numbers, and we talked about it, where, where the people were rejecting the bread from heaven that came down from heaven, the manna, they were rejecting that in the desert, and God sent snakes, a plague like Egypt, because they wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back into the darkness. You'll see that later. And, and, and so God sends venomous snakes, and they're bitten by the snakes, and many people are dying, and they come to Moses and say, Help us, pray to God for us, and Moses does. And, and God says, make a serpent out of bronze and put it on a sign. Put it on a pole for everyone to see. And, and if you look upon the snake and trust in what I'm saying, you will be healed. And, and, and so this idea of a snake on a pole, and we talked about how that has, is, is also the symbol for the American Medical Association and for medicine, we see this symbol. But this was a message that was, that was kind of obscure. I mean, it's a story that just takes this much space in the book of Numbers. It's only mentioned there. And, and later we saw that, that the serpent had become an object of worship, and King Hezekiah destroyed it because it had become an object of worship. And then we talked about how Nicodemus was told by Jesus that just as Moses lifted up the snake, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And, and Jesus draws a connection to a teacher of the law, to an obscure, small story found in the book of Numbers. And, and we speculated that perhaps as, as Nicodemus saw Jesus crucified, and we know that he did because Nicodemus took his body down, that perhaps these words came back into his head. You know, the way that the movies do when, when there's, everything is flashing and, and then silently in the mind's eye, you hear the words coming back, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And, and, and so Nicodemus, I'm sure, recalls this because I think that it's a statement for us, but I think Jesus was making a statement for Nicodemus 
for the moment when he saw him lifted up. And we, we said the word lifted up didn't just mean lifted up physically, but lifted up meant to glorify, and that in this one instance, all this is happening. And so last week, we left off there. This is what we covered last week. This is what we're looking at this week. Except there's a little bit of misunderstanding or controversy over this, because what's in red right there If you have a Bible that's called a red letter edition, then the words in red are words that Jesus has spoken. And so a red letter edition would have read from verse 10 all the way down through verse 21. Except I don't think that this section that we're looking at today, and that's why we stopped here last week, I don't think that this section was a continuation of the conversation with Nicodemus. I think that the red letters stop there. And and, and many commentaries would agree with me, and and here's why. Because something happens in the the way that this is being written and what we're looking at today, something happens. The the dialogue stops. There is no more dialogue. The, The use of past tense starts to take place. It seems much more reflective, and it seems that it connects directly to John's prologue, which we've talked a lot about. He gave his one and only son, we'll see, and in the prologue that it says we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son, and and we see light and darkness, and we see light and darkness in this scripture that we're looking at today. And, And so I think that what we're seeing here and what we're looking at today is, is John's narration, a narration of what's going on. Now, why does that make a difference? It doesn't. It doesn't make a lot of difference because it's still the Word of God. It doesn't make a lot of difference because Jesus could have said this directly to Nicodemus, and it doesn't change our theology. But what does it do if it's not the words of Jesus? Well, it tells the reader something that John wanted them to know. It tells the reader, that it, and that's us, it's, it's the people he wrote to, and that's us today. It tells us there's something here. This is kind of a summary of everything that has been happening, and it turns out what we're looking at today is a summary of all of this. In fact, the first verse that we look at today, John 3.16, perhaps one of the most famous verses, most preached upon verses in Scripture, John 3.16. It's what, what the, one of the first verses that we teach our kids in mem- to memorize. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Martin Luther would say that that one verse is the miniature gospel that it explains all of the gospel, compacted, condensed down into this one uh, verse. So, so what we're looking at today, I think, is John saying, here's some stuff that you need to know to put the dots together. Nicodemus didn't have this advantage, but you do. And, and so take use of it, take advantage of it. But before we get into the discussion of the scripture for today, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, before before we start going into that, we want to understand some more about family. And and when I say family, it's more of a term today. I think what would be more accurate to use if we were in Jesus' time wouldn't be family as much as it might be kin, uh, clan, tribe. And, and, and so the idea of family, the tribe, the connecting point of relatives was huge in Jesus' time to the people of Israel. And so a family, you know, we think, when I think of family, I, you know, first off I think of, of Annie and me and our four boys, and, and then it extends out some from that, and then it extends out from that, and, and it extends out from that, and <clears throat> if you're the Karen family, then th- this <clears throat> represents more, yeah, because, because they have their Christmas party in Fellowship Hall, Right? Uh, and, and so family, you know, it's very connected. And when I've had conversations, you know, with, with people uh, from, from the family, it, it's a very 
big family that you get together, you do things together, and, and so this idea of, of family is perhaps even bigger. But family, at Jesus' time, is a huge concept that we need to understand. Your identity came from your family. It, when, when Jesus met Peter, he said, Peter bar Jonah. You know, bar means son of. Almost everybody's name, Barnabas, was son of encouragement. The, the idea is that your name was included in who you are. Your name was incredibly important. Not just your name, but what tribe you were from. Not just what tribe you were from, but that you were part of Israel. And all of that was huge. So, so much so that marriage, you know, when we think of marriage today, you know, when, when our son Joe and Jasmine got married this past summer, they moved into their own place, right? And, and they were not related to each other. But in Jesus' time, when you got married, it was imperative that you got married to someone within your tribe, within your if anything, within Israel. But if, but if you married outside of the 12 tribes, you faced a lot. You, you would be discommunicated. Family, you married in family up to the point where it became illegal. And then, then they stepped back. So, so family members married inside the family. And when they got married, they didn't go and live on their own. They lived with the father of the groom. And, and, and so the idea of family is a little different when we think about family at Jesus' time. Employment was mostly based on family. If you were a, a carpenter, it was because your father was a carpenter. It, it, and, and so the idea of family, and if, if you broke off from your family's business to do your own business, it would be such a shock to the culture that no one would give you business because you just did such a horrific thing to your family. How could they be trusted if they go against their family? And so employment, religion was so connected to family to think of marrying outside of the Jewish faith. How could that happen? And yet we see instances where this happens in Scripture for God's design. Uh, but, but religion is, is a factor, as well as politics. The, the, the politics that you had of your religion were connected to your family as well. Your education was connected to your family. The whole economics of everything about you, your finances, your, your food supply, your everything that you had came from family, and everyone worked for family. And so family was this huge component to someone's life at Jesus' time. Power, wealth, property, land, honor, status. Your whole social network was all dependent upon being connected to your family. So, so all of your life depended on your connection to your family, everything. That's the way life was. And everything had a group attachment to the family. And what do I mean by that? If you did something that was um, good, it could only be good if it was good for the family. If you did something bad, it was considered bad if it was bad for the family. It was attached to the family. If you loved something, it was because it was connected inside your family. And you didn't love something that was not connected inside your family. In fact, you hated what was not connected to being inside 
your family. Now, again, family takes on rings. It's your, your family, your sons and daughters. It's your, it's your relatives. It's your tribe. It's the nation of Israel. This is family. And, and so when we understand that love and hate are attached to this concept of family, it, it starts to, to give you the idea of if it's part of who you are and it's good, it's family. And if it's not part of who you are, it's bad and it's not family. And so to be connected to your family was good. To be disconnected from your family was bad. And, and so when we start to see verses like this that can be problematic, we find you have heard, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard. That means that, that this was the, the, the rule of the day. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Love your neighbor. So the neighbor was included in your family, but the enemy who you hated was not included in your family. And, and so the people of Jesus' day, they, they loved their neighbor, meaning other people that are part of Israel, but anyone else was the enemy. Jesus starts to break down that, and we'll start to see instances where Jesus challenges the thought that your neighbor ends at the Israel line. How about when we look at something like this, when we understand family is associated with this love-hate idea? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. What Jesus is saying is that unless you are willing to disconnect from your family, unless you're willing to disconnect and connect to me, then you can't be my disciple. So hate is a strong word, and, and it could mean everything that we think of hate meaning today. But hate was also associated to anything that was not family. Is that making sense? And so when we see these words like love and hate, it has to do with being in the family or outside of the family. When we see words like light and darkness and these different contrasts that John does, it has to do with being in your family and out of your family. If, if you were uh, to marry outside of the Jewish faith, you might be excommunicated. You would be cast out into the darkness because outside of the family was darkness. Inside the family was light. Loyalty and disloyalty all had to do with family. If you were loyal to your family, it was good. If you were disloyal to your family, it was bad. And so we see things today, we can get some kind of an idea. We, we look at Harry and Meghan, right? I mean, what's going on in their lives? Everybody wants to know. Uh, but, but what's happening is, is, is he wants his life back. He wants to step back away from the family. And to some, they're saying, good for you. Get your independence. That's today's thinking. But Harry couldn't do this in Jesus' time. Wars broke out over people not paying attention to the strategic alliances of family. And, and so here we see this idea of it being scandalous, not loyal, not good, not bad, you know, because they're looking at having their own lives. And so we see now, though, in John chapter 20, and we've looked at this verse a lot because this is the verse that says, this is why I'm writing this. And so we need to pay attention to that. And, and John says, but these things are written, this gospel is written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You know, I just explained and took a long time, and there's a reason for that, as to Life existed and consisted of attachment to your family. There wasn't life outside of your family. And for Jesus to come and say, I want to give you life in my name. 
Now, we walk over this when we hear this. In Jesus' name, we pray it all the time and everything. But what we're saying is that if we're saying something in Jesus' name, we're saying we have an allegiance to the family of the name of Jesus. And so to say this to people in Jesus' time was saying, Jesus is asking you to leave your family name for his name. Now, a lot of us would say, whoa, <sighs> that's hard. But many of us, and many in Jesus' time would say, wait a minute. The widow would say, wait a minute. I don't have a family. You're saying that I can have the life of a family inside the name of Jesus? You're saying that I can be invited into a family to the orphan who doesn't have any parents and is out on the streets and, and starving to death? He's saying, you, wait, wait a minute. This is good news. You're telling me that I can be in the name of Jesus and, and, to, and have family life in his name? This was good news to some and hard news to others. So take a look again at what happened last week. In reply, Jesus declares to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And it means everything that we talked about last week. It is a spiritual rebirth for sure. But, but to the people living in Jesus' time, to say that you needed to be born again, you were saying that you were taking your inheritance off the table. You were saying that I don't, I am not going to be connected to this family. I will be born spiritually into a new family. And this was radical. And it was scary to the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do? And, and Jesus says, sell everything and come back and follow me. Be part of my family. Disassociate, disconnect from your family and connect to mine. And he won't do it. The prodigal son, though, sees this as, as very intriguing and beneficial. You mean that even though I made all these mistakes, that I can have life in a family of God and it be life eternal? You, this is great news. And so to some, this is the most awesome news that you can imagine. And to some, well, we'll see. As we look into this text this morning, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. As a joke, you know, I put the thing up this morning about a cold being equal to giving birth. And, uh, but I watched Danny deliver our children. I can't imagine giving up a child. It is off the charts unimaginable for me. Uh, how do you grasp this? I, I want you to just think about this, that, that God loved the world. Now, the reader who's reading this is saying right off the bat, wait a second, the world? You mean not Israel? You mean the world? You mean outside of our family? We don't do this. And then he's saying that he loved them so much that he gave his one and only son. 
This sounds so much like Abraham in Genesis when he was sacrificing his son Isaac, his one and only son. It, this, uh, and, and, and interestingly enough, Jesus is crucified in the same place that Isaac is offered as a sacrifice. That, that, that Isaac is stopped, you know, Abraham is stopped from sacrificing Isaac and said, God will provide the sacrifice. And, and then Jesus comes later to the same place and is the sacrifice provided that God sent his only son that we wouldn't perish, that, that we wouldn't come to ruin is more of a literal translation, that we would not come to an eternal ruin, but that we would have life, eternal life. And, and to the Jew, this is a family being called into a family. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, this is important because the purpose of Jesus' coming was not to judge, but to save. The purpose of Jesus' coming was not to judge, but to save. The next verse makes it so clear. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Well, it sounds like judgment. It sounds like he came for judgment when you read it at first. But what, what, what this text is saying is that we were all in need of rescue. If, if, if we were all, if this was a sea, and we were all floating and bobbing and treading water at sea, and someone came with a helicopter and said, to all who receive the rope, they will be saved. If you don't take the rope, you're not being judged. You're already in the water. We're all already in the water. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. For all. There is no one righteous, not even one, not even one, that, that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and some will be acquitted and some will be, the verdict is already in. In fact, that's what this next verse says. This is the verdict. It's interesting that all the other gospels talk and lead up to Jesus' trial and John begins his gospel with the trial of humanity. And the verdict is already in. The jury is already in. The, the verdict is this, that light has come into the world, but men have loved the darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So here's this contrast of light and darkness. If you are with Christ, you are in the light. If you are not with Christ, you are in the darkness. There's this family and outside of the family kind of understanding that's going on here. And, and if you're not convinced that the world is attracted to darkness, you know, how many movies do you see uh, that have to do with, with evil? How many exorcist omens? How many, how many movies do you see that are all about possession, all about evil at its purest form? And how many movies are about Jesus? And, and, and it, apart from Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, nothing has really filled the box office the way that has. We seem to be attracted to the dark, attracted to the evil in this world. We seem to be attracted to it. It becomes a discipline, you know, to stay faithful instead of the natural. And, and, and so this idea of loving the darkness instead of the light, it, it, it happens even to us. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. God wants to do things through us and have it be illuminated. 
Let your light shine that others may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven, it says in Matthew. And so this is, this is this dialogue, this what we're just looking at, that is to the reader, that's to us, to take in all of what we've been seeing in the Gospel of John and apply it. But, but there's one more thing that, that, that we may be missing. It, and it has to do with this John 3, 16 verse. Um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Um, interestingly, on campus this last week, I was talking to a bunch of students. And I, I, I ended up in the conversation saying something about I'm sorry for the Christians that have tried to force their faith on you. You want to know what their response was? What do you mean? I said, well, people who, you know, Christians who try to tell you what you have to believe. And they, they all said, I don't know what that, what, no one's ever, no one's ever approached me. We're, we, we've somehow stopped inviting people into the family. Uh, that's scary to think, you know, I would almost rather think that it would be good if we had a reputation for forcing our faith on people, almost. Because wouldn't that be something better than the silence that's out there now? So, if you were to ask, just going back to my point, if you were to ask someone who was Jewish at Jesus' time, what has God given you? For God so loved the world that he gave. If you were to ask somebody, a Jewish person at Jesus' time, what has, what has God given you? If you were to ask someone, even Jewish today, what is the greatest thing that God has given you? Meaning the family, the, the, the collectiveness. What would you say is the greatest thing that God has given you? Do you know what they would say? The law. God has given us the law, and that's what the Jewish faith is all about. The, the Torah that was given on Mount Sinai, the, the Torah that was given, the, the, the very words of God dictated by God to Moses. The first five books of the Bible is, is the Torah, and that is what God has given us. He has given us the law. And, and, and everything that they did in Jesus' time rotated and came around their view and interpretation of the law. The most sacred thing in the, in the synagogue is where they keep the scrolls, where they keep the law. God loved the Jewish nation so much that he gave them the law. He gave them the law. And it's beautiful. Psalms, over and over again, the, the, how I meditate on your law and, and how good is your law to me. And, and the law was intended to not be the rules of do's and don'ts. The law was intended to be a love contract between God and his people. And they were told to go and make love contracts and, and be a blessing to all of the others. And, and they failed to do that, perhaps in the same way that we're failing to invite people into the family today. But, but what happens, and, and, and how can I make John 3.16 more real to you? God gave the law to the Jewish people. God gave Christ to the world. He gave it. And, and, and when we think of the word give, then we need to expand our thinking because when I do a wedding, I say, who gives this bride to be married to this 
man. Who gives? So for God so loved the world that he gave, in the sense he gave the law, the physical embodiment of the law. Jesus Christ is the law incarnate. And he gave Christ to the church, the bride of the groom. Next week, we'll talk about the bridegroom. And, and so this idea that God loved the world so much that he gave. Expand your thinking. He didn't just give a son. He gave the embodiment of the law. He gave us a bridegroom. He's inviting us into a family where there is life, where every aspect of who we are and our identity and the power and, and, and the influence and, and everything should be for the good of our family. Always inviting in the others. Remember Jesus said, you've heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. We now come to this table, this family meal that symbolically represents all of what we're talking about. For God so loved the world that he gave and he invites us, he proposes to us. And everything that we do should be to honor and glorify the head of the family. Let's reflect on that as we prepare for this table. Let's pray. Lord, we cannot understand the love like that. And the, the many ways that, that we can see the idea of you giving, giving your son, giving us the living law, giving us the bridegroom, that we wouldn't perish but have eternal life. I, I pray, Lord, for all of us today that we would understand the connectedness we have with your family. Lord, that we would step in to this proposal to be part of your family. In Jesus' name, amen.